Hello there and welcome to Racehorse Movies, the show where two film fans take a racing sheet from last week, pick a random horse name for each other and from that name pitch a movie. In the pitch, to flesh out our movie ideas, we may include such things as stars, directors, composers, best boys and stable boys. Maybe not that last one. Hoping none of our ideas have to be put behind a screen and shot. The sky's the limit, the horses are on the starting line, the jockeys are frothing. It's time for Racehorse Movies. Hello, 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 and welcome to a very, very special, very bittersweet, emotionally loaded season finale episode of Racehorse Movies. My name's Graham Thomas, and I'm joined by the teary-eyed, but filled to the brim with love and laughter and happiness for what's coming up next, Mr. Luke Searle. Good evening, good evening. Hello there. How are you all? I hope everyone is absolutely splendid. Lovely to be here. And my, my lip is a quiver. Um, mm. But I'm I'm being very sort of uh, reserved here. I'm going to hold it all back, Graham. You're not going to feel an ounce of this emotion during this uh, ice in the veins. Absolutely, man. I'm a stone cold pitching killer. So everybody came. Everybody's in the lobby, milling around, thrumming out, chatting. There, man. Can you hear that? L- the murmurations of uh, happy people. So yeah, this is it. This is the season finale. Twelve episodes in. I can't quite believe it. It is, and I'm going to spring a little surprise on all of you. I know uh, we did say that you would have to pay for concessions. I've put some money behind the popcorn stand. I'd just like to say an extra thank you to everyone for listening. So you help mm. yourself, sweet or salted or both. You guys go crazy. Yes, thank you so much for the support over the last 12 weeks, 12.5 weeks, I guess. Absolutely, is. Uh, it's been wonderful. It's been a long time brewing. It's been a long time getting it up and running, and it's just been a blast. We've really enjoyed the process so far. But that sounds like more like a wrap-up, doesn't it? Let's get into it. Let's start the episode. Let's not wind down. We've got so much to get through. So let's get some people in and, and like sit them down and feet on the seats, whatever, man. The cleaning's on us as well. We'll get on the stage. We'll bogart the mic a little bit before we get into yeah. some pitching. And um, I thought I would throw a surprise your way, or our way, and a way to everybody in the mind cinema. I was going to ask you what you've seen lately, but I thought... Why not talk a little bit about cinema experiences or film experiences you've had throughout your life, things that might have struck you, things that you remember very vividly. Now, I have just sprung that on you, so it might take you a few seconds. No, I'm immediately, I've got straight out the bag, man, like no question. Because I remember the first time, one of the first times I met you, I can only meet you once, kind of, for the first time. (laughs) Well, I I was was wearing a succession of false hats and beards. No, sorry, real hats, false beards. Yeah. (laughs) I think one of the uh, the first time I came to your room when during university, I saw on your bookshelf you had every single cinema stub for every single cinema trip you'd ever been to. Absolutely. So did. winding back to the first, the bottom of that pile, can you remember what it was? I absolutely can, because it left quite the indelible mark on my soul in a very good way. It was Jurassic Park, man. I was a latecomer. Yes. I was a late bloomer to getting to the cinema, and I distinctly remember being taken by my uh, mum and aunt uh, to the cinema to see Jurassic Park, and I didn't really pay... I loved films, but I didn't necessarily Mm -hmm. pay attention to film news or anything like that. I wasn't particularly aware that it was coming. I knew that it was about dinosaurs, Mm -hmm. but I was obsessed with dinosaurs. I think everyone has a bit of a dinosaur phase as they're growing up. And to then see them writ large and real, which they looked to me, they looked... Certainly did. Especially the the, uh, the T-Rex on the car with the eyes, the pupils dilating, (laughs) all of that kind of stuff that sold it even further. And it just absolutely blew me away from start to finish uh, and... Coming out of that film, the excitement that I felt certainly showed me the power and the fun of going into a cinema and getting completely lost. And I had my tiny little uh, stub from the ABC cinema and I treasured that for many a year. What a great film to have that solidification in your mind of the power of cinema as a place to go, place to see. I remember seeing it uh, for the first time, I was 13 years old and... I'd bought into the merchandise because I was slightly older than you. I'd just finished reading the book. It's one of my first big books. Yeah, that dude, it felt like a growing up book reading it at the time. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And I I read the novelisation as well. I I started collecting the sticker. I was perfectly targeted towards all this this hype, so I couldn't wait to see it. I remember being really scared during the T-Rex attack when it comes through the roof and they're underneath it. And and they've got their hands and feet on the glass. Yes, I was really, really scared of that bit. And my mum was really, really scared at the bits where Ellie Sattler, Laura Dern's 
uh, character has to go and turn on the power, oh. and he gets attacked by the raptor. Thank the first God time you see here. the raptor, <laughs> yes, and then Mr. Arnold's arm comes out, and then it's, it's for just for like 15 seconds, it turns into proper horror. It's really scary. Oh yeah, and that freak that freaks my mum out. That was yep, yep. Okay, nice. Any um, any movies in general? The first film you remember having a reaction to, other than a cinema trip? Because Alien, I remember going for an early morning walk with my dad and saying, I was well before I should have been watching Alien, but the Channel 4, I think, had the home premiere of it. Mm -hmm. And I'd seen some of the trailers, and it had space, and it had it was definitely about aliens, I knew that much, so I was like, I need to see this film. And I was like, Dad, would it be okay if I watched Alien? It's not. And gave him this massive rehearsed speech about, <laughs> I, you know, obviously I'll look away if it gets too much, and you know, blah, 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 as, as a 13-year-old <laughs> mite or a 12-year-old mite. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, well, ask your mum. And then I went to mum, who by this point, I think, had shown me Terminator and Lethal Weapon, so I didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> and then I was like, can I watch Alien? And she was like, oh, okay, then as long as you know you promise to look away if it gets too scary and all of that kind and then sitting there and watching alien um as the camera is tracking through the nostromo at the start i remember mm. shaking with nerves i was that hyped up and ready for an <laughs> alien just to jump out and terrify me and instead i got terrified in an absolutely whole nother way um over the course of a slow burn hour and 40 minutes and i was nice. it was i was absolutely unprepared for everything i was going to see but it hit at the right time that it didn't it terrified me but it didn't put me off it exhilarated me my first interaction with alien the films my mum go back to my mum again I'm not sure how the conversation started, but she said the scariest film she's ever seen, and she only saw half of it, was Alien. Mm -hmm. And I was quite young. And so just for an adult to say that really put me off, and it made me really scared of it. Yeah. And I asked my sister about it, and she gave me the premise of Alien. And then she said, oh, there's another one. And I was a bit scared, like, there's another one? And then she said, this time there are thousands of them. And that, like, really shook me up. And then I remember in our local supermarket back in the day, they used to have racks of posters. And they had door-shaped door ones you put on the back of your bedroom door yep. or whatever. Yep. And they had one of them of the alien and it's bursting through. Yeah. And for whatever reason, when I was in the supermarket with my my mum doing the shop or whatever, I was really scared to go to the poster section because of that picture. But I knew at some point in that shopping trip, I had to go to that section to look at it and it would i'd have to build up the courage just to look at this poster <laughs> of this alien and then my mates almost like a a video nasty my mate got a copy of aliens on vhs and he put it on in the living room and it took me like three trips to his house i think to finish that film it scared the balls off me i watched aliens maybe uh, six months ago and it still blew me yeah. away it's incredible it um is. but you, with an understanding of the technical uh, genius that went on behind the scenes to create it as well, is, is a, almost a whole nother level of uh, enjoyment that goes hand in hand with it now. Do you think when, when you know about the whole camera trickery, lenses, staging, special effects, um, opticals, all that kind of stuff, when you know all, all the tricks in the magic box, does that take away the, any enjoyment from you or does it enhance it? Uh, it's tough because uh, it's uh, I tried... Uh, really hard to turn all of that off after doing, you know, film degree and all of that kind of jazz because I did feel it really started to erode my um, natural joy of things. Mm -hmm. So now I'm quite good at keeping it under control and not getting too picky unless something is really not grabbing me, in which case then... You slip into that analytical mode. And that's fine because the film didn't have me anyway. Or if I love a movie, maybe I get a bit more appreciation out of how it's been constructed and I get certain other sort mm. of like grace notes and things that really tickle my fancy that add to my love of a film. So yeah, I, don't... I think if you can understand the craft to some degree, it can only enhance what you're seeing because obviously everything is a decision. Nothing really happens by chance. So the staging of a scene, if you understand why the camera's placed where it was, how it moves, what's being shown and where... It can really, for me anyway, it can really enhance all the elements working at the same time. Yep. And it can just enhance everything. And then sometimes if, if there's a mistake or a decision where it's like, oh, why have they done that? I quite like that because then it makes me think, right, well, I'm going to... I'm going to see where this leads. If they, like we've talked in this podcast many times, when they zig, do you zig with them or do you zag with them? Yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. in films, they make a choice is made and it just breaks everything for me. Now I'm like, I'm out. That yeah, was yeah. such a dumb. Why have you done yeah. that? that? That was such an open goal, but you went this way. Yeah. As if I'm better than the filmmakers. <laughs> so I think maybe that's a symptom of 
like the amounts, the sheer amounts of films you watch over a lifetime and also getting older, time gets more valuable. You just, I think you just get a slightly more discerning about what, Allows you into the into the screen or not? Yeah, yeah. So nowadays, as we've talked about many times on this podcast, and when I go to the, the cinema with my friends and stuff, come out and I really this usually I really loved it, but I really loved it, but I could shave twenty minutes off that film. It's usually around the runtime. It's definitely runtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah like it flagged yeah. a little bit in the second act, and you start to latch onto these kind of. Um, decisions that were made or pacing issues that kind of leap out more rather than, yeah, it was a little bit too long, but I loved X, Y, Z. I've got to get back into that mindset of just putting all the amazing things uh, at the forefront of my mind and celebrating it because, as we know, no matter how bad the movie is, any movie that is really, it is a miracle that a movie is made. Yep. You know, no matter how bad it is, it's a shame that bad films do get made, but... It's so difficult to make a movie. To yeah, and people put it don't together. start out and think, I want to make a film that people are going to complain about, that's going to piss people off, mm. that's going to feel too long, that's going to have a stupid twist. Yeah. People don't want that. They want to make a good movie. It's such, even if it's a movie with your mates and it's a small thing, or if it's a low-budget film that's got funding, like, I don't know, Rye Lane, which is wonderful, um, just the effort that requires the, the village of people all working together to get that onto a screen for us to see it's just a miracle and I think we should all and I'm certainly going to try and do it spend more time celebrating even the good looking for the good parts rather than bemoaning the fact that it's 20 minutes too uh-huh. long or it slumps in the second act I think I need to definitely make a conscious effort to celebrate the fact that I'm watching a movie and watching someone's art and finding the bits that are working and latch onto those yeah, I want to go back uh, or channel into some of the me that was in HMV buying five VHS or DVDs for 20 quid mm. and just taking chances on... And I yeah, used to go yeah, to yeah. the sort of second-hand shop that was in the other town near where I used to live when I was proper young and my pocket money was a fiver. I'd go and spend that on the next rental or a VHS that was being sold for five quid, whatever it was, and I'd just be taking chances all over the place. Yeah, take these chances. And to that note, I think, should we come back for another season of this podcast i think we should do some set some challenges for us so if we do some pitches maybe we say okay whatever we do with our two horses you have to pitch it as if this film were made in the 1960s for example just forcing us to seek out films that we might not have seen yes or change our reference points just find ways to widen our knowledge and our love for cinema on future pitches and in that way Hopefully, we should start celebrating the power, the beauty, the love, and the hard work and dedication it goes in just willing something from the mind cinema out into the real cinema. Find these little films that make us feel like we've seen Jurassic Park for the first time. Yep. Something that gives true emotional reactions. There we go. We've got, we've got a, a, a manifesto, dare I say. We have a manifesto. <laughs> Join me, brother. <laughs> well, I can already hear... Lloyd's footsteps on the ceiling stamping. He's pacing. He is pacing, He's pacing up and down. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Despite despite the murmuring of the crowd in front of us, we can yeah. hear those uh, those clod hoppers <laughs> making their way upstairs in the projection room. I think that we've bogarted the mic on the stage yeah, we absolutely for long have. enough. So I would say thank you to everybody so far in this podcast who's joined us on this journey. And Lloyd's going to fire up the projector, and we are going to pitch some movies. <laughs> So, guys, the tension has ramped to fever pitch and we're going to reveal what we're about to get up to. We did, uh, I believe, give you a little trinkling, a little uh, scattering, smattering of a hint that we would be uh, looking at the 540 at Navan in Ireland. Uh, We are at the Kevin Bell Reparation Trust, uh, Pro-Am INH Flat Race, um, which is one of the finest races that Navan has. I I have it on very good confidence. We have got 15 horses running... Oh, my days. What are we going to do with all 15 horses? What we're going to do with all 15 horses, Graham, Mm. is we are going to run down there. If they had hands and and not Mm -hmm. hooves, we would get them to extend their hands so we could run down high-fiving them on the way. Nice. And as we were high-fiving them, we would be giving an off-the-cuff pitch for each one of those 15 horses, Graham. 
Surely we're not going to be pitching 15 movies 15, of the mind. 15 <laughs> films. Phase. This is more than the Lord of the Rings extended editions back to back. This is get your get your sleeping bags out and and get your hot chocolate, I well, guess. Well, we didn't warn you about this. So if you look under your seats in the mind cinema, you may see that we have been kind enough to provide some sleeping bags. Yes. Some Pro Plus. Lots of Pro Plus. We've got coffee on tap. As I said, concessions on us, guys. I've got it covered. Yeah. And some half-smoked cigarette butts that Lloyd has donated from his estuary. Yes. So, yeah, guys, we are going (laughs) to have a look, and we are giving you uh, one race, all the horses. We're going to hit the first one. This is where we have radio silence and dead air. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have yeah. to say All you guys it. are going to hear is the clicking of a mouse and like some frantic <laughs> typing on a keyboard as, <laughs> as we can solve Google for any dead kind air. of inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first horse on the, in this race is called Meet My Laurelie. And now, this is a tricky one. Have you got anything for this? Sparks off the top of your head. I've got, well, Laurelie... <laughs> Is a, um, I think it is a folk tale of an Austrian or German woman who was um, heartbroken over her philandering lover and hurls herself into the Rhine. Oh, heavens. This is Laurelie, and then gets reincarnated as an avenging siren, I guess, to lure people or lure um, unfaithful philanderers and whatnot. Philanderers, yes, to the rocks. Holy moly, okay, right, I had no idea. That ghost must have been doing a hell of a lot of people killing over her time. Yes, so we have Meet My Laurelie, so what that immediately means to me is we do a riff on that Renfield film. So so someone's going out to bars to find arseholes to lure them (laughs) to their lovely lighthouse. And then, oh, have you met my Laurelie? <laughs> and then these horrible people. So it's a cross between Renfield and a promising young woman. That is absolutely <laughs> amazing. Yeah, OK, absolutely. Yeah, what time period were we, were we in here? Are we, is this a period movie that we're going to be doing? No, no, we're doing it. We can do it now. Yeah, sure. That's my speed pitch for Meet My Laurelie. Or you can imagine a kid uh, wearing adult clothes, which is always scary, as we've discussed offline in the mm-hmm. past, uh, saying it and luring someone in a cave or something like that. <laughs> That's very specific. Well, look. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, thinking it's like it's about a boy and his monster, and the kids will see the spirit of. Um, Laurel from Laurel and Hardy. Oh, wow. So oh, you're breaking it down now. The spirit so that, of Laurel from yeah, Laurel yeah, and Hardy. So, so uh, Stan Laurel, there we go. Yeah. And that will be how the beast, the monster manifests to the kid. And it's also this Laurel mm. is not a good thing and the kid should not be friends with it and it starts, like, picking off the family yeah. or something. I think we'd probably have to set this in... I don't know how many kids would recognise no. the ghost of Stan Laurel and go towards <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, he, these well, days. the kid is I'm not like, calling our audience idiots or anything like that or out of touch. I'm just not sure the cultural relevance to the TikTok generation of Stan Laurel. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay, so we have to first Does manufacture a like a TikTok wave exactly where like a Laurel and Hardy clip for some reason goes viral, mm. <laughs> which is then picked up by this young kid who then finds a monster that also has seen this clip, I guess, because why else would it manifest as yeah, uh, Stan Laurel? Uh, and those two converge to right. spill blood across the town of Makepeace, Alabama. To those of you who have just got up from your seats and are walking out of the mines, I promise you yeah, it's yeah. going to get better. <laughs> it's definitely going to get better. <laughs> I, I make no such guarantees, uh, right. mind <laughs> cinema guests. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to think that mine was slightly better, or Ooh. at least it made a little bit more sense. Yours made sense, I think. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will go with that, man. The next horse <laughs> on the list is called Is She Now? What do you got? You got anything? It's, it's something about someone waiting for a boat and getting more and more insistent, but maybe they're trapped in a limbo somewhere where the answer is it's right, never like coming. A, a waiting for Godot kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is she now? Right. Okay, mine is fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> is she now is velvet buzzsaw stroke neon demon horror satire about an influencer who goes extra viral but only because of someone obscure in the background of their tiktok everyone's focused on that person and not them so they start to 
lose their influence a little bit or they, they their power gets drained away. Yeah. And this person gets more more obsessed with this person who's accidentally gone more viral in their own viral video, <laughs> starts follow starts following them. And like making selling, sure that they're in the background of the video and stuff. Yes, first, like tailoring so. yes, tailoring their life, trying to ingratiate themselves then maybe like a bit like Ingrid Goes West I guess yes bit of that yeah I was there. feeling that yep. maybe then I've put <laughs> I've, no I was running out of time I've written down fake accounts online love puts on her skin <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's the time honored tradition, Graham, of if yeah. you start a fake account, you're going to end up wearing someone's it, skin. skin. The I think that's a, it's a natural, natural <laughs> puppet. So I thought at the end, this person gets so sad they might murder them accidentally or something, realise that, oh my God, what have I done? I've murdered the person that I'm obsessed with. Who's I better my put a skin on. on. I better put a skin on. And then pretend to be that person. Then it will switch around. She will take, or this influence will take over the person's life of the person that she killed, the obscure person in the background of a viral video so that you can keep the counters going. She will then hire an actor... To be her. To be her. Yes. So that she can be in the background of the, the social media thing she's taking of herself wearing the skin <laughs> of the dead person. And is the skin going to, like, deteriorate over the course of the movie and this is how she's found But then, she, then she'll start doing, like, makeup tutorials. Well, no, it'll start like to that. be like Death Becomes Her when they're trying to make themselves up when they are being ravished yeah. by all of the uh, injuries and whatnot that have been mm. uh, the cast about them, man. Yeah, okay. I love, I love that. That especially the part that I 100% got sold on was when she hired someone to be her. Like the skin thing was beautiful. And then for her to be wearing that skin and I, I want her to also be wearing the skin at all times. So I want some scenes uh, that are tense where she is wearing a uh, like big hat, wig, sunglasses. You can see sort of like maybe mouldering skin in the background. Mm. But this other person she's hired is only interested in furthering like their weird account that they got. So of course they accept it without it too much trouble because they want control, the cash. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yes. Bang, green light. She, green light. Is she, is she, she now? now? Is she so now? <laughs> That's what it sounded to me like it was like, <laughs> oh, she is so now. Yeah. Is she now? Oh, you would not oh, believe how now that girl is at the minute. <laughs> And then it ends in a... I, this is almost feeling... This is getting, like, Nicholas Winding Refn or whatever. Um, yeah, and well, in Neon the Demon end, was a touchdown. Absolutely. Like, they're peeling the skin off and, like, she's just, she is now, she is now, she <laughs> is now, and that's the end. We cut to black. I think she goes completely mad because, obviously, she's mad enough already. She, she has Peel, skin Peels off, off her skin or it just falls off and now she... For some reason, magic, I don't know, she looks like the person that she's hired. <gasps> oh, so, oh, so then it goes yes. into like an It Follows kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's your Dude. B-movie ending. Uh, and then we have our like sort of mid-credits flashback for the dun-dun-dun, an influencer filming a fucking t one of the TikToks, mm. and in the background, there she is again. There she and is. the monster continues. Oh, There we go. Here's she now. Right, A24, <laughs> I'm going to give them a ring immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone in the audience from A24? Yeah, yeah, just give us Meet a little the lobby. They'll, they'll touch a horror movie every they'll now touch and again. It, yeah. Meet us in the lobby. All right, so that was the first bit. Is she now? We're only two in and we've got 13 more to do. All right, this one <laughs> I've got fucking six words for this one. Charming Fortune. Charming Fortune, yeah. Gambling. All I can think is gambling. Mm -hmm. Uh, slick gambler, we're going to Vegas, yes. we're going to have yes. an absolute romp and a great time with whoever this gambler is, who has an absolute knack. Um, Their surname is definitely Charming, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I put Heist Movie, Charming is the surname, Danny Ocean. So basically, <laughs> we're, we're making Ocean's Eleven. Yeah, if we 11. just get the Ocean's Eleven script and copy, replace uh, Danny, no, Ocean with Charming and Elevens with uh, Mickey, then we'll be absolutely fine. So are we going heist movie or are we going gambler on a losing streak becomes on a winning streak then like a Mississippi grind thing or um, or the cooler? I, well, that's it. I'd be tempted to play with like the fortune that he has and like the, the luck that he does and doesn't have that comes in waves that he can kind of influence by following certain rituals maybe or mm -hmm. he has such a psychological control over himself as do we all that he can convince himself these placebos that he puts in place to win the matches are the things that help him win maybe. Right, right. And then he loses some of them or... They get taken. Well, he or... he meets someone who interrupts all of those rituals, and it may be in 
in like a that. plant. No, no, no. Or oh, just someone who gets in the way of his life because he's, you know, quite a sort of closed off, focused dude. He's very uh, OCD almost in all the things he has to put in oh, place. Oh, like, um, what's the matchstick man? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like Nick Cage eating uh, tuna fish all the time. Mm. Um, and he's got that. And then someone comes in and brings him so many other things, but also completely derail all of his lucky totems and all of his uh, rituals and everything that he needs to win the cards. But then eventually he'll find out that's not that's not what he wanted. He's got the prize. Oh, and so this lovely it's, new got person, a nice, it's got a nice little love story rather than that person being someone who was sent in to disrupt it. Okay, that's charming fortune, kind of, I guess. Gam- That's pretty good. We've got gambling something gambling. Runabout. Uh, a gambling runabout with um, a Charming. gambler who who has the Mickey Charming, who has his... He thinks he makes his own luck. But he is quite hampered by the vast amounts of rituals he needs to go through in order to be successful at the tables. And he is successful at the tables. But maybe he put, it's because of his skill, but not really but all these debilitating rituals that he... Puts himself through, through constantly until that is finally thrown off track when he meets somebody. And he realises there is more to life than rituals and fortune, baby. Fortune and glory, kid. Fortune, fortune and glory. And glory. All right, that's why I worked that one out. Yeah, that was good. All right, number four. <laughs> Horse number four. Doyen Lady. Now, a doyen is someone who's very good at something. It's like a master of the field? Yes, a master of their, their ways. Immediately thinking Judy Dench as a the leader of like a... A uh, finishing school back in the 20s. I was 20s. thinking finishing school, yes. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. There, but maybe we go uh, Kingsman or something like that uh, and actually yeah. like they are the best of the best of the best. They're not like the best ladies because they don't give a monkeys about being ladies. They're, they, they're the best of the best. But they're also... Amazing spies. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that they, they can ingratiate themselves into ambassadors' dances and everything like that. And everyone just says, oh, delighted to meet you. And they can pick pockets and they can go and do spy stuff. <laughs> yeah, and then and the minute all, that they turn, that smile goes and it's business. So you'd have these big, all these ambassadors are talking about all these governmental secrets and stuff like that. Yeah. And the women from uh, the Doyen Ladies Finishing School are just quietly taking it all in. Because they're so invisible that that is their strength. Yeah, absolutely. And they and then and, and when all the, the books on the head nonsense and how to stir a cup of tea goes, it's like at night. It's they are trained like like the SAS or whatever. Like yes. they go through yeah, rigorous, yeah. amazing training. Each one of them is an absolute flipping weapon, man. Uh, we'll have <laughs> we'll have uh, Maggie Smith can be like the head of the Doyen Lady School. Yeah, each one's got a different kind of class, like their yes, teachers. Yes. Like one does the books on the head, one does the walking, one does the polite manners, one does the how now the brown cow, and then the minute yes. that how now brown cow, the chalkboard flips, and it's like how to speak like German, how to speak Japanese, <laughs> yes, right, and they're just all right. like how absolutely radio, how to repair radios and stuff like that in the field. <laughs> the sewing classes, how to make shift sew a parachute and or stuff a wound like that. as well, how yeah. to like sew on yourself if you've been cut open in this a fight. This is amazing. This is the best one we've done. A hundred percent. Then we're having Gemma Arterton and Hayley yes. Atwell as the yes. sort of our two heroes who lead us through the film and who start the finishing school at the same time. And they're sort of like a yes. Um, oh no, I think they should they should be like sixth formers or that they're then hasn't graduated yet, but they're near the top. Okay, so we, like a new ingratiate, a new kind of grad. A yeah, new yeah, there are eyes in. Yeah, yeah. I want the woman from. Sex education and also living because she's fantastic. Amy Lou Wood. Amy Lou Wood. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 She's going to be our bad ass entrant who thinks that she's been shipped off by her miserly old oh, awful stepmother. Aunt. Stepmom. Yeah. 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 Who, yeah. Her miserly old stepmom who is like one of the greatest agents who ever came for the Doe Lady recognizes something in her. Although Amy Lou Wood's character thinks that she's just a crotchety old horrible woman. And once, and she wants to go to I don't know, have her own life. But she, she wants to travel to Paris. To she wants to see the world. Yes. She doesn't want to go to this finishing school. I'm not going to get shoved into your. She yeah. gets sent off to finishing school because secretly she recognises the ingenuity skill and um, badassery that it takes to become a doyen lady <laughs> and enter the service. So the triangle is Maggie Smith, Judy Dench, mm. Olivia Coleman, Gemma <laughs> Atherton and Hayley Atwell side by side, yes. and then we got Amy Lou Wood as the new intake as the new as the new recruit. That would be amazing. All right. Next one on the list. We've done some good ones, actually. Yeah, Come on with this. Okay. <laughs> next, next one. D Capo. D spelled D E E. Capo. C A P O. 
Now, when I first thought of this, unfortunately, I went TV and it should be a movie. So maybe we can do a movie spin off of Dee's character from Always Sunny in Philadelphia, <laughs> where she, they have maybe they're locked in one place and it, or it's just the gang. And through crazy machinations and schemes, she, because she's always been the bottom of the rung in the gang. Yeah. And she becomes the capo, which is like the leader of <laughs> the, the gang, the, like the, the yeah, head, yeah. the godfather, through some huge machinations. At the end, she get even Dennis Reynolds admits to her and bows down that she is the greatest and she is. <laughs> But it'd be like scheme upon scheme, and she's like Vicini in a prin- the Princess Bride, or something yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, or yeah. Machiavelli, or something. She yeah, just... building the house of cards, uh, setting yeah, everything in place, them. setting everyone up. Yeah, yeah, and it will start with like a massive overorder of beer or something like that to the yeah. uh, to Paddy's pub, something like something really something innocuous like that. that gets everyone so angry and everyone's freaking out. But it's all by these designs. It's all over the city, and like it takes it all the characters, <laughs> got runner through history, big budget. Always Sunny in Philadelphia movie whereby D becomes the eventual ruler of the gang. <laughs> D Capo. I think a Capo maybe has ownership of other gangs as well. I'm not quite sure. I might have to check that. Yeah, I wouldn't. But if that would be great. Like she takes over the McPoy Hall clan yeah. <laughs> and some other, <laughs> some other gangs. I imagine in the, city. The, cool, the meeting of all the gangs together yeah, in like, like a we'll, warehouse, we'll uh, we'll a top end, lit. Like a warrior's kind of yeah. thing. Like, can you dig it with D and all the gangs of Philadelphia? <laughs> yeah, and you that. just close up D's lips on the microphone as she introduces herself <laughs> yes. to everyone in the crowd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my. We haven't really done TV, but that's a TV movie. Well, a that's movie that's fine. That's a, a movie. It's still a movie. It's still still at the mindset, and that's still completely legit, man. There we go. Done. Next one, Rodney. What do you got? I mean, it's hard not to just want to do a Nicholas Lindhurst retrospective or biopic. Um, yeah, that feels like I, I went biopic as well, but not Lindhurst. Dangerfield. Yeah, I was going to do an SNL fueled. Rodney Dangerfield biopic. Absolute chaos. The way I would frame it, because you have to have some kind of framing device. When I was reading about Rodney Dangerfield, it said they did a really touching sketch on SNL after he passed. And it wasn't, it was more like a a homage and a touching thing. Uh, Rodney Dangerfield, played by an SNL regular whose name I can't remember, comes up to the pearly gates and St. Peter says, I I know you, don't don't I? And Rodney says, I'm Rodney Dangerfield. And then and he said, you're the comedian, aren't you? And then Ron, Rodney Dangerfield rattles off all like his best jokes and his best lines and his, a big kind of monologue of all his best moments. And then um, he says, can I, can I come in now? And St. Peter says, of course, I just wanted to hear them one more time. And then, he let, and then he lets them into heaven. So Aww. that doing that sketch would be like the framework to put the Rodney Dangerfield biopic around that. So it would be, be the actual, it would be the actual sketch. So they're writing the actual sketch in the SNL studios to say goodbye because he's just died. Yeah. And when he, as he rattles through his punchlines and his jokes, it goes to the origin of that joke. And amazing. Yeah. Drop in and out of his life as it goes through. Room for tons of amazing uh, cameos from all of the Saturday Night Live cast as they're coming in at the time and talking. Oh, you're doing that Rodney thing, and oh, hey, maybe you should think of this. I wouldn't recast all the ones that are alive would play themselves as young, but without any young makeup or anything yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah. So yeah. Bill Murray would look like Bill Murray does now, but he would be, we'd recreate scenes from Caddyshack, for example, yeah. Yeah. but with Bill Murray now. I like that a hell of a lot. That sounds brilliant. That's my Rodney. And you would do uh, Only Fools and Horses, Rodney Trotter. Absolutely. Would, you, would, it, would it be Nicholas Lindhurst or would it be... I think it would be... It might be Rodney who, after years of living under the shadow of Del Boy, um, starts to get quite bitter and twisted and starts to try and mm. undermine all of Del Boy's wheelings and dealings so he can branch out finally on his own to be known as right. Rodney. Rodney's yeah. independent traders, not Trotter's Absolutely, independent man. traders. Exactly, because okay. he has spent the... Rodney, you plonker. How many times has poor Rodney heard that? His self-esteem <laughs> at this true. point has been worn down <laughs> to a horrific, <laughs> tiny little nubbin, man. And he yeah. looks, you know, he's all, he's all, he's all shrugged shoulders and internalised. He wears camouflage all the time. He's trying to hide himself, even in the show that we've already witnessed, man. That's nice. how much he has been intimidated over the years by his elder brother. Okay. We could do a twist on that, and we do it a bit like the episode of The Zeppo in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. 
And now, for those who are not familiar with, the, ah, with Buffy the, the Vampire Slayer, yeah. it's a, a gang show. of high schoolers who battle demons. And one of their members, Xander, he hasn't got any special powers. He's quite cowardly. He's a bit like Shaggy from the Scooby-Doo yep. gang, I guess. Yep. And there's an episode called The Zeppo, um, whereby <laughs> the whole episode's focused on him. And he kind of gets dismissed by the gang early on in the episode for being an idiot and a fool. And we just go on this wild... Um, adventure episode with him following him all the way around the town over one over one evening he fights loads of demons he gets involved in loads of adventures and deals I think he he has sex with a really really beautiful woman and he's a really shy awkward gawky teenager and it all circles back and uh, he comes to school the next day <laughs> and like they're like oh he's back and he, but he doesn't reveal any of this information he's just gone through all of this massive life changing stuff and he's back where he was so we could do that with Rodney but what he does which would be quite sweet is he just saves Del Boy's ass through some yeah 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 this is like the biggest deal of their life uh, and all of the money that they won from the pocket watch, like all of it is on the line. Yeah. yeah. Loads of schemes have gone wrong and it comes back around and they do the deal and it's great. And But he never reveals what he went through. A bit like Billy Joel in um, Stiletto. Has no idea, yeah. um, Del Boy has no idea this is going on. It's all the stuff around him. And Rodney is running um, from pillar to post, trying to organise it, trying to keep... <laughs> a bit like Uncut Gems, you know? He's yeah. just doing deals and deals and deals okay, and deals and deals and deals. The Safties are coming in to direct Rodney <laughs> yes. and, uh, without <laughs> shadow of a doubt. I need to see this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Safdie brothers are directing a feature-length episode of Only Fools and Horses called Rodney, whereby Rodney runs from pillar to post organising and sorting out a load of mishaps in order for Doughboy to make a deal. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good Rodney <laughs> Safdie brothers, Only Fools and Horses. Like, yes. Who would green want that? light. Green light. <laughs> okay. Next one. Minerva. Spell M-E-N-R-V-A. Is the largest observed crater on Titan, which is the largest moon of Saturn. Sci-fi. So I was thinking classic 70s disaster movie like Towering Inferno or Airport 77 set on this mining facility on Titan, on, yeah. on Minerva. Yeah. And because they're a colony, there's loads of families there. It's this thing. They mine too deep, sinkhole, um, the thing's collapsing. You have all the, because it's a classic 70s thing, where you've got loads of these B-plots of the families running oh, around yeah, this facility. Yeah, all over trying the place, get getting reunited and split apart. And, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but we wouldn't have Roland Emmerich because we wouldn't have some stupid alien invasion thing. or It's just a disaster movie about this collapsing semi-forgotten steelworks or mining facility on Titan. Or I like, I like. Um, let's almost do a rendezvous with Rama. Uh, sort of someone discovers Minerva yeah. and it needs to be explored by the X number of finest scientists that the Earth can uh, provide and inside mm. Minerva is a number of unexplainable, inexplicable, inexplicable magical because any technology beyond our understanding is magic events that happen to the crew um, as they voyage inside Minerva. All right, nice. Wow, we're getting through them, aren't we? We're doing all right, man. Yeah, that's number, number seven right. in the bag there, guys. Number eight was pretty much the midway point and it is Lady Goliath. It's hard for me to not have a Ridley Scott biopic about Goliath's uh, significant other. And As in David and Goliath. Of course, man, of course. Just goes through Goliath's absolute stone-headedness and stupidity and refusal to... <laughs> <laughs> that worked out well for him, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And all along, she's just like, Goliath, man, he's going to fuck you up. He's got God on his side. <laughs> what the fuck are you, doing? What are you doing, dude? He's got God this guy is, <laughs> This guy's serious business, man. And it's it's just like, we'll probably we'll frame it as a Ridley Scott effort, but we'll have it as just a really tight uh, Noah Baumbach-esque sort of emotional drama <laughs> between uh, the Goliath family uh, and just saying okay. all in all and it'll end with Goliath like getting in a hissy fit because he always does and slamming out the door saying well with or without I'm going to go and I'll see you in a couple of hours so we have we film it we have no bone back like Greta Gerwig um, Adam Driver Adam Driver's got Goliath Adam Driver's got <laughs> Scarlett Johansson is Cassandra Goliath yeah 
So it's filmed like that. Everything was normal. But every once in a while, they go outside and we realise that they're like 900 feet of like these little cows. Or maybe in the sea, like little cows might wander through the bottom of the sea. The kids are watching TV with popcorns, but the popcorns are live chickens. <laughs> <laughs> a whole cow in a taco. <laughs> yeah, and Goliath's got like a person between his toes at night when he's cleaning his feet and things. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a big one. It's a breakdown of a marriage between Mr. and Mrs. Goliath, played by Adam Driver and Scott, Scott and Johansson. <laughs> <laughs> Ending in the I mean, tragic. they have already done that for they have already done that for with Noah Baumbach, but we'll do the comedy version. Yeah. Okay. I like it. Now, are they? Do they? Are we modernising it? Because I mentioned popcorn and stuff like that. Or do they? Uh, when I think of David and Goliath, like he's in a loincloth and Goliath looks like a, a giant. Well, that's the thing. Like a Harryhausen. Like, so when he goes in, we don't see the fight, do we? No, 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 no. Well, we. No, I don't think we should. Like, I'll, see you in an, I'll see you in two hours. I, th- I like that I'll be back in two hours. Yeah, but I Dead. told you so, you know, just like out and then gone. We know what happens <laughs> yeah, to like Goliath. That. Yeah. I like that too. I don't know why, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking like Harry Housen style stop motion. Yeah, like, well, let's get with Anderson. He can like be an influence yeah. bound back Anderson. We can have things flying around. Live, plate, live filmed plates for backgrounds, yeah. real sets, but their stop motion. The, 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 the Goliaths. Yes. The Giants. Yes, the glass of stop motion. Everything else around them is like filmed live and back projected and stuff. So it's real. Right. So when you see cows come in, they're real cows. But they are massive stop motion giants. But they are massive blown up stop motion giants. Oh my God. I can, I can, <laughs> I can see Adam Driver's claymation stop motion face and it's making me so flipping happy right now, Graham. And he's, he just looks so good with his hair. Oh my goodness me. Right, done. Yep. Okay, who's directing this? Uh, well, we've got Baumbach or uh, Anderson Baumbach, or Gerwig. Yeah. Gerwig has got the wonderful Do you know ability who I think to... It, yes, or you know, Gerwig would be fantastic, or I was thinking maybe to really get some <laughs> angst and existentialism than, like, Charlie Kaufman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, so we're going Anomalisa kind of stop yeah, yeah, motion. Right, okay, yeah. oh, but only oh that would be so look. oppressive, man. But then real, but with them real world elements to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like the skies, the grass... To, that he will make that so incredibly <laughs> oppressive, scary, awkward and awful that, yes, we have to have him in. Yeah, OK, so Kaufman directs Lady Goliath. I like that. Done. That was pretty good. Cool. Zipped it <laughs> up, mate. <laughs> oh, so dumb. All right. Silver Midnight is our next runner. Silver Midnight. Silver Midnight. I've got a... Um, it's got to be, there is no question in my mind, a 1970s, like, driving film. Uh, sort of like Vanishing Point. OK. Interesting. So it's the name of a car. It's going to, yeah, Silver Midnight is the name of a car, much like... And I, I, uh, I think um, get Jeff Nichols in to direct something mm-hmm. like this. He did the same with Midnight Special, and I yeah. wanted the way that he filmed the car cutting through the night throughout all of Midnight yeah, Special yeah. was so propulsive and exciting. OK, what's the story? Look, I'm not going to say that I have a story to go with that, Graham. That's just, that okay. was my initial feeling. Um, I think he'll be, he'll be doing some kind of a run, maybe a drugs run or something like that, mm-hmm. from state to state. He's get, taking it over state lines, so it's federal. It's really risky, but he needs to do it to get a sum of money so he can then be gone and live his dream. OK. All right, so what I'll do is I'll port my pitch for the next horse, which I won't name, because it's pretty much exactly that, and I'll bring it up to this one to fold it in. So Let's do some merging. So I had Vietnam vet truck driver... Kind of goes mad, becomes a counterculture figure. So I'm thinking like uh, Vanishing Point, as you mentioned. Absolutely. Or The Park is Mine or Rambo. So yeah, it, it has so that, cool. like this dis- disenfranchised, comes, comes back from Vietnam, like the um, Rolling Thunder. Rolling Thunder, absolutely. That we like very much. So we have that alienation and the times they are a changing cinema of Vanishing Point or whatnot, he becomes this counterculture figure. As he's making his drive. And he's carrying like this, he's carrying like uh, probably at the time just like pounds of weed. Mm. Um, and, yeah. and he's okay. and, and that is what, you know, the counterculture latches onto that, even though he thinks it's like disgusting, he wouldn't touch the stuff. He ain't that kind of guy, man. But he's, he's making this wrapped up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe he. Um, so is this his, his. I think what if, I, if he hitchhiked, he was hitchhiking, so he's lost his job, he's lost his home, he's lost everything, he's just a loner, he's a drifter. Mm-hmm. 
and he gets picked up by the original truck driver of the Silver Midnight, and through circumstances, that driver dies or gets shot. He witnesses some police brutality. It triggers him, and, he, and he's... He's about to maybe get shot or arrested for vagrancy. He's a Vietnam yeah, vet, he's yeah. triple purple hearted star, or whatever. And in that moment, he kind of accidentally kills a cop or knocks one out. And in a moment of panic, gets in the truck or whatever it is. And it's just a truck because I can see him. I can see him getting in the, in the truck. truck. He's got blood on him. And he can use him. the CB radio to pre- preach his message. Absolutely. And just, he just uses it just to, as a getaway. But as he as the getaway continues. He's on the CB radio. And he's got a convoy following in. him because, like, you, you CB radio works within a certain range, I believe. Okay. So if you want to hear him continuing to transmit, you've got to, like, haul ass and find the guy, man. Nice. And, like, there's this... and then there'll be radio stations phoning in, talking to him. Yeah, late people. night shock jocks and, like, this is Bill the Wolf Thompson, 3 a.m., and we got news on the Silver and Midnight. He's coming through town, guys, so you watch out and stay shot. And then... And then you'd have people phoning in, other Vietnam vets would have flashes of them around the city phoning in about their story. And he becomes this mouthpiece for all the disenfranchised Vietnam vets as he's hauling us across America, across all these mid, uh, mid-American Midwest towns. Midwest or whatever. Are, like, Midwest yeah. towns are like ghost towns now. And, and, that, and that's his Okay, that's so his we have, uh, we'll have the, um, the radio broadcaster that... Dial, he dials into that dials into him that's got a CB radio mm-hmm. that they connect with first and like he tries to yeah. maybe talk him down but then realizes that, that ain't going to be the case get, so he's just going to follow on the, the side. guy man. Yeah. yeah and he gets talked round by our man in the cab yeah so then the the police will get to the radio station and they're like well just keep him on the air so he does and he get these stories come in and there's this jock this DJ maybe a vet himself, is having the, the, like his moment. He's having this amazing show. People are camped outside his radio station. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. It. Tailgating all the place outside. They've got barbecues and, and his, he, they're broadcasting a bit like uh, Pump Up the Volume. We're talking that yeah, kind of energy. Yeah, exactly. And then the cops that are in the radio station who are telling him to broadcast, maybe he turns a couple of them and they become on his, on his side because they're vets or their fathers were vets. Or, or their, their brother, brothers, their or their brothers, brothers died out there. Out there. My brother died out there like last week. So the, the, the police chief comes in and they lock the police chief in a cupboard. Dude, so we've got airheads, we've got a bit of airheads as well got a bit of airheads in yes, there. Yeah. Yes, Anything to keep the silver midnight going. But of course, vanishing point, I'm style, afraid. no I'm spoilers. Yeah. He does probably to to kind of galvanise his status as a county culture icon, he probably does have to come to an You've end. You've got to Thelma and Louise it, man. You've got to Thelma and Louise it, either a suicide by cop hail of bullets or vanishing point star badassery going out on your own terms. Absolutely. It's, it's going out on his own terms, man. And he just uses it and he uses the radio and he uses his, his drive it to express all his rage and his sadness and his heartfelt anger about his treatment, about what he went through and about all the other vets who are phoning in, helping him and sharing their stories and they're really connecting. They're, they've created this online, huh, on-air community yeah, where yeah. they're sharing stories and maybe there's a section, a dark section in the middle where one of them is at the is like he says he's got a revolver and he's in a bed set and he's all alone and they talk him out of yeah, 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 out yeah. of um, dying by suicide. So then the cops are like, you can't shoot him, he just saved that guy's life kind of thing. So within it, we will, uh, within his complete rebellion against the system, we will pepper the meaningful interactions that he has um, either um, face, you know, face-to-face or radio-to-radio or... Um, it, through the shock jock on all of the people that he's affecting positively as well and that will be his journey is like making their individual lives better as well as making this massive statement against the system that screwed him man amazing oh that's a beautiful film i'd watch the hell out of that Amazing. So that was Silver Midnight. What is the next runner, my friend? Uh, Right, number 10. Um, We've got Disco Boy. All I could think for this was um, a human traffic style biopic of uh, Carl Cox or something like that, maybe. Okay. And we will get to witness his rise throughout the UK music scene and all of the people, like in in a Winterbottom style, fable larger than life all about his career, I guess. Disco Boy, to me, sounded like a gang, a 70s New York street gang, the Disco Boys. Warriors style, yeah. Although it sounded like quite sad, like there's only one of them. Like he's trying to start a gang. 
Oh, and, and he's hanging out it, on the metros of the subway, sorry. Yeah, and he's got he's his all uniform. got his colours, but no one else always knows get, about always them. Always getting beaten up. Because yeah, he just looks like a dude wearing weird clothes. Yeah, no yeah he's just got like, a red sash, like the cowboys in Tombstone or something like that that he wears. Oh, it'd be really sweet. And then at the end of the film, he gets a mate. And a bit like Napoleon Dynamite, that is going to be my touchstone. <sighs> okay, so he, so get, he gets, he a, gets a mate. And the end of the film is they go... He get, takes his jacket, which says Disco Boy, to the leather rhinestone shop, and they just start studying in S on yeah. the back of Boy because he's got, oh, And dude. then they both have him. And then they walk out. Then they walk out <sighs> onto the street, and he walks out, and his mate joins him with a similar jacket. And Black they do Betty's the, the starting mark. to play, yeah. man. Bam, yes. dum, dang, dang, down, bam, dum, dang, out. Yeah. And throughout, right. throughout this film, we'll have four, or f- three or four instances where. <laughs> like the first time he tries to get into um, Studio 54, he just literally gets beaten up. Yep. Like the, the second time, he just gets laughed out. The third time, maybe he gets through the door, maybe to the second bouncer, no chance. So yep. this time, we yep. don't see them go into Studio 54, but there's two of them and they're walking towards it, but they're walking so confidently in their beautiful two jackets that say Disco Boys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, and it's a definitely, Napoleon, definitely. Napoleon Dynamite, very, very sweet. He's an idiot, but he's got heart of gold and he won't quit. Super bad. I want an element of super bad in the trying to get into the club over and over again and trying your hardest to get the thing that will make you cool and feel special. Okay, that was Disco Boy. But I like that, dude. Beautiful. The rhin- when, the minute you mentioned rhinestoning a jacket, I knew that I'd green at that film, man. <laughs> that was beautiful. Okay. Next, we're going uh, number 11, this is, guys. Uh, we're going Joe Hannigan. I'm immediately thinking cop. Joe Hannigan is a cop. Uh, he is... I guess he could be at the end of his rope, uh, as, as all cops are yeah, in these movies. All cops are at their ropes. <laughs> so maybe he's actually, like, we're going for more, um, like, in Falling Down um, with Robert Duvall's character. So he's really at the end. He's a bit of a joke. Everyone just thinks he's, like, some pot-bellied, beer-swilling, drunk, gun-not-pulling-out <laughs> son of a bitch, man. I've had an idea. OK, hit me. Because I know you love this. You're going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> Hannigan is the cop, right? Yeah. Joe is his new assignee, rookie, who is obviously the best police dog. <laughs> oh, no. Is, oh, God. That has oh, ever heavens. been assigned. Something, something happens. Body swap. <laughs> 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 Hannigan leaps into the body of Joe. Oh, my God. Joe gosh. somehow leaps into the body of Hannigan. <laughs> so it's like when some people have like talk look who's talking like they can understand each other they're like yes, voices yes 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 he's and, the dog <laughs> and so like so the dog so Joe, so Hannigan his. as the dog Joe will have yes. to like tell Hannigan who is actually the dog dog Joe and has got and has got the dog's instincts like really good at sniffing stuff. I don't. Yeah, yeah, he's like, great at finding and running. Can, he can run yeah, really running. well. Sniff coke on some perp like three blocks away. <laughs> but but it's still a dog. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. He's just like and he's getting distracted sat by at things. His desk, he's like trying to sniff his own. <laughs> <laughs> just like licking at himself yeah. and grooming and, Joe, and scratching at himself. Well, then maybe his foot. Joe should be, well, maybe Hannigan as a cop should be quite well to do. So when he's a dog, he's eating, he's disgusted that he has to eat out of a bowl. Yeah, yeah, he wants okay. like a napkin and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 the, do- yeah, yeah. the dog trying to use cutlery. So actually, like the, the fellow police officers actually start to respect Hannigan more because he's broken out of this like tight ass like <laughs> yes. shell that he's been stuck in for the last like 30 years. <laughs> years of working there. Like, Hannigan, I ain't never seen you get up on your desk before, man. You're full of beans today. You know, that kind of thing where they're just like amazed at how... And like, I can't believe you did that in front of the chief, man. You really gave him hell, man. You started barking at him. Are you kidding me? The really weird scene where he goes to the urinal for the first time. (laughs) He's just got got his leg up and he's just... (laughs) But using Hannigan... The man, but with the dog inside, using his sense of smell would be a boon. And Hannigan, the dog, using his... Brains. Human He's got a human mind in that dog body. That's got to be worth something. What benefit does it be... What benefit is it to Hannigan when he's inside the dog? What does that help him do? 
he could get in small doors. <laughs> he could like break in through dog flaps. Yeah. So all of like the main bad guy has got a love of dogs, man. A bit like um, Charles Dance in Last Action Hero, who's got the triangle okay. of uh, like Dalmatians or whatever it is, uh, Doberman. So he's like he's got a massive respect for dogs. And when we first meet um, Joe and Hannigan when they are in the correct bodies, they'll have an altercation with the main bad guy mm. who's like um hannigan's been on his case but he can't like he's taken the sniffer dog to smell drugs because he's been informed that there's going to be a drop off at the main bad right. guy's house and they go up there and like the guy's like keep that dog in a lead i've got loads of dogs so that that can allow us entry, entry. into what if, okay so what if the dog when it is actually a dog was good at sniffing <laughs> drugs or whatever but <laughs> i just like that that's a sentence i'm sorry <laughs> what if the dog when, it when it's really... actually a dog <laughs> <laughs> Was really good at sniffing stuff, but failed all the physical stuff. Like, it was really cowardly, a bit yeah. like shitty. But, like, Hannigan, the cop, when he is a cop, was really brave. So when he becomes into the, when he comes into the dog, he does, like, really heroic stuff. Like, running into a burning building. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Or, yeah. like, jumping in front of uh, his partner to, and taking a bullet for them. Like, suddenly this dog becomes incredibly brave. Like, like Hannigan, dog Hannigan has like <laughs> loosened up loads and like everyone's yeah. loving that man even though he doesn't talk but he says like because when when hannigan's in the dog's body he, he, he's he able to communicate to and he yeah. says or he says like just like don't say anything say you've got a sore throat or something like that but you're going to keep on going you've lost your voice for a while until we get this thing going man but like he's loosey-goosey and he is acting like amazingly as far as every cop's concerned and also in this relationship the dog also <laughs> seems to be improving like joe yeah. is improving because he's got a human in him <laughs> and like like, they're both just what absolutely smashed through for the humans. Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> Climb in a poodle, guys. See how much it makes us <laughs> <it> say. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Who I'm, do we get to direct this minefield of inappropriate and offensive material? I'm trying to think of like someone who's like who does who does pent up. I'm so I'm just like I'm thinking about Hannigan now and who does like pent up bookish, officious. Who sells that really well, hmm. but but can also act like a dog in a human's body? <laughs> it's not like I'm asking for much from our cast here, man. You could reteam Feral and Wahlberg, maybe, or something like that. Okay, like, well, yeah, Feral yeah. could probably do quite a good about to be retired Hannigan, I think, maybe. Mm -hmm. And he's very good at you know that real like you know uptight like real nerdy, real button down kind of a dude. I think he might be able to pull that off quite nicely, maybe. What about J.K. Simmons? Oh, there we go. Okay, right. Scratch what I just said. Because he can obviously be explosive, but I could imagine him being very ordered with his desk and stuff yep, like regimented. that. regimented. Regimented. Knocked down. Not getting the joke. But obviously it makes it so funny for us, the audience, because of his sardonic way. Yeah. But for yep. Or Bob Odenkirk would be really good. Odenkirk would be awesome. I, I think I like I think I think like the first JK one, though, man. Sometimes. Yeah, I think I'm up for JK, because think of his uh, what he did in... I'm going to get the name wrong. I'm going to say Palm Springs. Oh, yes, fantastic. Yes? I was, okay, there, well, there you go, because I was thinking for the voice of Joe the Dog, Andy Sandberg. Yes, right, there so we go. So we'll have a repair of them two. Perfect, perfect. There we go. That's absolutely locked in. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's so dumb. Cool. I love it. There we go. That was Joe Hannigan. So this brings us to number 12, Hayley Grove Bonnie. Tricky one. Haven't got much for that. Hayley, Hayley's Comet, Grove, Biker Grove, Bonnie. Um, Bonnie Tyler. Bonnie Tyler. So we do a Biker Grove biopic about Hayley's Comet is about to land on Biker Grove School or. Youth Club, I don't even know what Biker Grove was, if I'm honest, apart from a weird, scary laugh. <laughs> oh, I've got no idea. Okay. I can't remember the name of the app. I think it's three letters or three something. Uh, what, uh, what three words? What three words? Of course, okay. it's what three words. It's a survival film. Yeah, so Haley Grove Bonnie, it's a bit like Cliffhanger, plane crashes, load of money goes out, and they know that it's landed at Haley Grove Bonnie, which is a two-by-two two metre one by one meter it's square. Very, yeah, it's, it's bang on, like it's like uh, given an XY coordinate or whatever. So it's absolutely bang on exactly where you are. You will be found if you enter these three words. So aeroplane with some money on it's flying over the Andes. Other aeroplanes from cartels, whatever, are chasing it. Aeroplane gets shot down. People bail out. The drug money or whatever it is. Yeah, the fire case, in the engine. Yeah, it's just like an absolutely engine, unexpected. Yeah, oh Jesus! Yep. Case falls out onto the Andes. 
and it lands at Haley Grove Bonnie, the one meter by one meter pinpoint, whatever it is. Yep. And uh, which also coincides with some hikers and a. Yep. So let's get a vertical limit so, kind of yep. feeling. We want going some on accidental here. hikers. Well, no, they are purposeful hikers in an accidental yes. situation. Yeah, yes, thank <laughs> like, you very hold much. Hold on, guys, we're on a hike. I, 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 thought, I thought I was about to play tennis. You're serious, isn't it? Oh, no, we're hiking. Half over a mountain. The hikers who find themselves in this accidental situation, yep. there's the cartel that are after it, there's yep. the CIA that are after it, yep. there's the alternate CIA because there's the bent CIA and there's the real CIA yeah, chasing yeah, yeah. the the bent CIA. Yeah, bent CIA want to take all the drugs and sh- siphon it straight into the shady dealings they've got to fund some kind of freedom fighters maybe, elsewhere. Okay, maybe it's not the Andes, maybe it's the Appalachians because I'd quite like Haley Grove Bonnie to land right in the middle of a very angry nest of bears or something. Yeah, <laughs> they have to like yes. fight off a load of bears to get to it. Okay, so yeah, we're going. We're going to mix in a bit of the grey here a volcano. as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so maybe like a, a nearly active volcano that is like because I, I kind of like the idea of that because i just imagine people but then where would you get a hot suit from or a cold suit whatever you use to get into a volcano i'm not sure my lexicon's all off man but Haley grove bonnie is the destination is the pinpoint of where this object is and it's a race against each other time weather and the elements, some kind of bears, ticking clock. Volcanoes. Bears, we volcanoes. might have a bear's nest in a volcano. Dinosaurs, we haven't ruled out yet, guys. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah, there we go. Yep. Hayley Grove Bonnie. Sorted. Number 13, That's guys. Easy. We're now on to Workman Jimmy. Now, I had another biopic. I had that as a biopic of Jimmy the whirlwind white the snooker player who oh, was the nation's mate. champion my, my favorite snooker players from the 70s and 80s and i think he was six times world finalist and never won he's like the, he's oh. regarded as like the greatest champion who was to never win yeah 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 and he was obviously a massive hard drinker hard partying animal much like they all were and but he just had this kind of indomitable spirit. He was so funny and sweet. Everybody loves Jimmy White. Everybody loves nice. Jimmy White. Okay, okay. So I would do a against all odds style biopic of Jimmy, the man who never quite got over the line, but won everybody's hearts along the way and played some. And he and he played some of the most beautiful snooker, like super wild. He, almost every shot was a flare shot. He was just. A, Incredible player. Dexter Fletcher would direct it. Of course, of course. We've got so many lovely cameos again that we can throw in for, yeah. you know, Steve Hendry and the rest. Like, we could yeah, really yeah, cast and Hurricane most Higgins of, and yeah. um, John Parrott and Weir, Weir Bernard could have the hard partying. You'd have the rise of the popularity of snooker on TV. Some of the old guards, like Kirk Steer, yeah, big break, they're coming into the big break era. We'd have Kirk Steer. It's a bit like Ricky Lanford, but a more positive, happy yep. version. Yeah, 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 yep, yep, yeah. I mean, Ricky got there in the end, but it was he not did, a great he did. journey. He didn't it take any journey. of the knocks that life gave him in the spirit that Jimmy White did, man, yes. quite clearly. So you'd have this, you'd have this big like rock star, a bit like Rush, I think, kind of style film where you had the yep. excess, the focus on the sport, this this continual drive throughout his career, and that'd be Workman Jimmy. What did you have anything for Workman Jimmy? I didn't. It, it was a like a knee jerk reaction was um, a sequel to the Emilio Estevez Charlie Sheen 1990s something film Men at Work. So let me do a quick uh, quick synopsis: is okay. uh, two garbage men uncover a conspiracy involving illegal toxic waste dumping and decide to bring the whole operation nice. down. And so he will uh, he will go on. Uh, we're, I guess we're going to go Edge of Darkness, the uh, sort of like uh, Gibson nuclear thriller that was oh, out. Wow, we'll go going and darker. We'll, yeah, yeah, we're going to pull it back in, and Estevez, mm-hmm. Estevez is going to bring the clout that he has as a director. Now, uh, Bobby, that was an absolutely mind-blowingly good film uh, probably about 10, 15 years ago now, but he's got the chops, mm-hmm. and that's what he's going to bring to uh, Workman Jimmy. Workman Jimmy. Okay, so we've I think we've only got a couple more runners left. Oh, my days. So that was uh, number 13, unlucky for some. That mm. we've, oh, I've turned into a bingo caller accidentally. <laughs> I didn't mean <laughs> yes. to do that, but it happened somehow. It, well, uh, it's your fault for wearing a very, very snazzy waistcoat. And that, that is true. That is true, man. Well, I wanted special some evening. It's the finale, so, special evening. That was number 13. Mm. That zips us. We've got two more left, guys. It's making me sad. I'm enjoying this very much. Um, we are on to number 14, which is called Whispering Jesse. 
Sounds like an insult, doesn't it? You say you're such a you whispering whisper, Jesse. Whispering Jesse. It sounds like a yeah, Scottish, yeah, yeah. specifically like, Scottish it's insult. A whispering maybe. Jesse. It's a whispering it's Jesse. That guy. I was thinking, not not going too Scottish. Uh, I might say, <laughs> well, we could have Scotty. We could be you and McGregor. Not? Could play Jesse. Uh, I'm the thinking. Only Scottish uh, person we know. Quite well, Gerald Butler. There we go. There you go. There's my other one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not right. at all. Whatever happens next, Gerard Butler's in this. I want, okay, no, Gerard Butler is Jesse, right? And Jesse, okay. he's an assassin come ex opera singer who had his voice box <laughs> shot out. And that was what led him onto the road of uh, becoming an assassin. <laughs> Ken is a. <laughs> Sorry, definitely. I'm in, hundred percent on that. <laughs> but when he's when he when he's killing people, or when he, he takes an assignment, his catchphrase is Ness and Dorma, which is none shall sleep. But he has to. He, but he whispers Ness and Dorma, Ness and Dorma, oh. Ness and, Dorma. Oh. and then the hand on the. Well, that's what he says when he gets his revenge. Normally, he doesn't say anything because he's super silent. Yeah. But then when he goes on his. A rip roaring rampage of revenge. Then he starts oh. to speak a little bit, and then yeah. like the, the, he, his handler, who turns out to be the bad guy or whatever it is, yeah. when he kills him and he puts his hand over his mouth, so the bad guy can't talk. And then he gets his chance to Ness and which was the aria he was singing when he got when his throat boxed. The- well, it went through, man. Yeah, yes. and it was like, okay, so he was singing at an ambassador's event or like some giant political rally or something like that. Mm. And mm. as he leant forward to do the Ness and and boom, bang, Bam. his entire neck got shot out by a sniper. So he's got no training? No, no, he has to go through all of this training. For some reason, I'm also getting, I don't know, I just strong dark man vibes to this film <laughs> 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 Do you know what I mean? Because of the yes. voice and the. Yes. Um... And he's going to have to wear like a the scarf around his neck, so he's always going to have he's going to have a distinct sort of like the shadow or dark man. Yes, definitely. But he's going to cut a fine of, silhouette. I always want him to be wearing the same tuxedo that just gets more and more grubby or dirty, like a uniform, or yeah, or, he, or a cloak. He definitely has to have some kind of. Uniform. Yeah, he's got the operatic like flourish. Superhero y kind yeah. of thing, but without any yeah, powers. Yeah, yeah. But he has the silhouette, he has the the look, feel. And obviously, we'll get Sam Raimi to direct <laughs> I was, was going to say, that was exactly what I was just about to say is like, and we need man. Sam Raimi coming <laughs> and cutting some fine silhouettes of Jesse. Uh, yeah, you just Still played by Jerry Butler. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Dorma, old Nessa friend. Dorma. Unbelievable. Yes, 100% Sam Raimi's directing this. Whispering Jesse. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, has uh, he known? Is he know? Has he been given that name? Like, we got another kill on the street. Anyone you know, cop? And cops like nobody I know. Nobody has that distinctive mark. Like, he always rips out their throat pots or something. <laughs> or like bites out the throat in a fit <laughs> of pique or something, man. No, no, he's learned. Yeah, he's learned to be. That is his kill shot, I guess, man. Oh, like, oh my god, we're going, Tom. We are going Hannibal thing now. All the people he killed were part of his own. A part of his um, injury, so like the, he gets the sniper, the shooter, he gets the shooter's handler, he gets all the people that are involved, yep. and he kill, kills them in the same way, and removes their voice box, and a bit like Buffalo Bill, they find that he's reconstructing a <laughs> voice made box. A voice box piano. <laughs> 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 no, he's, re- he's reconstructing a voice box so that he could have that as his own voice box. Oh my maybe, god, yes. So he can finally talk. <laughs> Matt, that's why he maybe he does it at the end and he can finally say yep. Ness and Dorma, made from the voice boxes of the of enemies all of his he previous blew out kills. His- <laughs> 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 so yeah, we've got like so he, he hasn't got a handler because he's working alone. Actually, no, he's he doesn't have a handler. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's he's not got time, man. He's got a he's recover- taken out but he's got a personal doctor box. who is yes. like completely involved, and he becomes his uh, his confidant as well, and gets embroiled in the whole thing, and yeah. is like being delivered oh, little, sis- little sister voice sister boxes. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's the the city's leading uh, doctor in throat surgery. She yep. helped him heal, and, but he'll yeah. never talk again. And then she has to working on a prototype throat box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh, my God, at some point we may be able to make you talk. I don't know when, yeah. but it could happen. We and just need like... these parts. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> in ice. If you can somehow find these parts in ice... Yeah, yeah, we haven't to... got any donors. No one's donating yeah. voice boxes, man. It's, it's a real tough market. And it's market. signature kill. Like they, he only takes out the certain bit that he needs from each person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's only it's takes... To this thing. I mean, the more we talk about it, the more I wish I knew what a voice box was like. That is, that's Whispering Jesse. <laughs> Listen, Dorma. Dorma. <laughs> Shoot him through the neck. <laughs> Excellent, there we go. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Gerard, if you're out there, please. Come on. And he did uh, Phantom of the Opera. That was one of his first... I think it was like... It was Yander Bont or Rennie Harlan or someone directed oh, him. Oh, they were. Or he Schumacher. To... Sorry, Joel Schumacher okay. directed him in Phantom of the Opera. So he's already got the experience. He's well-versed in trash then. Yeah, well, that's I mean... That's what we're for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, look, we, we don't want to piss him off before he no, signs up. please accept so, no, I don't know what you mean, in our film, and please don't punch us in the face. There we go, that's, uh, that's Whispering Jesse. So that was number 14, holy moly. The last horse, and uh, maybe the last pitch of the season, perhaps. Oh, goodness me, yeah, no, I don't. I'm going to get all misty-eyed and stuff after such uh, jollity, man. But yeah, we're going for number 15, guys, uh, and this is uh, Going Easy. What have you got? What I have got is we're do, we've, we've had a biopic and I'm kind mm -hmm. of having a... Uh, Two. It's a film about the making of a film and obviously that film okay. is Easy Rider, man. And nice. we're going to have em Emil Hirsch in there as Jack Nicholson because I want to see him play okay. Jack Nicholson and I think he'd do a brilliant job at that. Alexander Skarsgård as Peter Fonda. Yeah, okay, that is absolutely Slim perfect. him down a bit he's, and get rid of Well, no, that. he's got the gangle. Um, and I mean that in the nicest way, man. Uh, that's a compliment control, yeah. from where I'm from. Yeah, but he's, he's got the limbs for it, absolutely. Hopper... I don't know who's got the ferocity and the mm. intensity. We need someone ferocious, intense intense and terrifying because, like, Hopper was running off with reels of film during the filming of it and locking himself away and editing it and going completely Hopper mad. Well, we've mentioned him in every single episode so far, but Barry Kogan? Right, there we go. Yep. I can imagine him with a big handlebar moustache. Get those small eyes big. Small, <laughs> eye, small eyes with a nice face. Sorry, Barry. I meant like... I love that as a direction from Barry Kogan. Get those, get those small, small eyes big, eyes kid, big. and you'll go places. <laughs> That's lunch. <laughs> Piss holes in the snow. <laughs> um, I don't know. This, I, he's, he's, he feels... He's, he's got... Is he not like... Not, he's, he's more internal? Do you that's think, the thing. Than, he's got too much yeah. of a meekness about his ferocity, man, which I love, okay. and that's why he's so good. But we need someone bombastic... Explosive ballsy and bombastic. and ridiculous as, as Hopper, man, which I, 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 I can't even... Uh, Shia LaBeouf? That's genuinely... That's it. Yes, of course. Yeah. Alexander Skarsgård and Shia LaBeouf is Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper. Yep, and we got Emil Hirsch's Nicholson. Okay, so and it's it's a straight up biopic of the making of this film. Well, it has to be uh, it has to be the legend of the making of this film because yeah. that's all it can be at this point. So I don't want it. To, I want it to have um, lovely flights of fancy, um, uh, be they terrifying or fanciful. Like as we mm. see the things that Hopper's getting into. There's a lot of LSD involved while they're filming. All of these kind of things need to play into the. Uh, the uh, the presentation of the movie without a doubt. I got an angle. We break it up into we do the, the obviously the making of but we break it up into three or four iconic scenes of the movie on them meeting Jack Nicholson or them on the road, whatever. Yeah. But each one of those two or three scenes, we do it Rashomon style. <laughs> so it's, oh. it's it's done from the point of view of the filmmaker. Then it's done from the point of view of. Dennis Hopper when he's just going fucking mad it goes really surreal dude any any of like almost all of Dennis Hopper's POVs are like animated and yeah. like completely, completely off the wall completely wild yeah. but, they, it, but it is like Rashomon like it all links yep. up and it does make sense just totally different perspectives trying to aim towards creating this new th this way thing a truth which is Easy Rider absolutely fantastic shout and that is going easy that's what it's going to be it's going to be the POV from those three main stars and we're going to see how they all completely disagree with each other as to how <laughs> that film the was made. the completely. But yeah. somehow come, came together through all that hard work, effort, love, determination to create something, put it on screen, much like we spoke about at the very beginning of this episode, to make Easy Rider. Yes. That is amazing. That would actually generally be a, a really fun, interesting film that deconstructs the perspectives the artistic challenges that one brings the collaboration of filmmaking the artifice of filmmaking that's pretty good yeah. i think that is a really lovely film to end this run of 15 pictures 
Because it talks about everything that we've talked about in this episode. And we, I want to get some of the elements Drugs, of... motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> All of those things. <laughs> Counterculture. Handlebar moustaches. <laughs> well, there we go. I think that is 15 fast pitches. 15 fast-paced pitches. Pretty much made up on the spot. Perhaps as you may or may not be able to tell. <laughs> Certainly developed on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I like I like that we hide that as a revelation, like made up on the spot. <laughs> it's like, like, was you it? wouldn't believe. I thought that was so rehearsed. We didn't prepare that. <laughs> well, okay, that was the 15 off-the-cuff pitches. That was pretty good. And I just remembered last week you pitched that amazing all-timer of Stiletto. And I remember... Going back to when I gave you that horse, the episode before, episode 10, I guess. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I gave scans. you Stiletto and I said... Yes, you did. I, I know what I would do with Stiletto yes, and I will you give did. you my alt pitch next week, which I didn't do. So I'm just going to slot it in now. It's like two lines. That's a beautiful tease. Okay. Okay, because I remember you saying that when you gave me that horse and that has been niggling at me well i'm glad we didn't actually include it in last episode because it would have might have disrailed or just added a little bit of extra seasoning to your perfectly prepared meal that was stiletto okay i'm still thinking about it um but my my alt pitch as soon as i saw the word stiletto as soon as you saw it you thought of the song yes right so as soon as i saw it i saw or i was reminded of the number one henchman of baron von greenback in danger mouse (laughs) stiletto (laughs) My dear stiletto, you have done it again. So my stiletto would be the origin story of stiletto, how he comes to be into the service of Baron Von Greenback. Baron Von Greenback, who is just presumably Von Greenback when we meet stiletto at his... Yes, and then they team up and Stiletto helps him become Baron Von Greenback. They take out a few enemies on the chessboard that are above them and they rise up the rooms together. yeah, yeah. And maybe he offers him, like, the right-hand man or, like, a seat at the table. And Stiletto is, like, always out there doing it. He wants to be in the field. He will just, like, always do his own thing. He'll always go his own way. But he's loyal. And I get, I get to do my Baron von Greenback impression. So. Stiletto! Stiletto! Oh, brother! Oh, brother! <laughs> <laughs> so that would, as soon as I saw the word Stiletto, I thought I have to get... Stiletto from Danger Mouse. So that's also just let me on. Like, we haven't done too many old pitches. Have you got we haven't. any that you might have been kicking around that you haven't had the opportunity to dish out from any previous films? The first one I can think of is I think uh, this was for. I'm going to go for episode zero. I think this was our in, in our absolute first episode we ever published. I think it was Ricky Langford and Six Ricky Hands in Langford. My Pocket, I believe. That's correct. Yes, good memory. Absolutely. Well, well yeah, yeah, it sticks, man. I mean, Ricky Langford is an absolute all timer. So, Six Hands in My Pocket uh, is about some brothers in the Wild West, Mm -hmm. one of whom is the best talker the West has ever seen. uh, And he will step up to any situation uh, without a problem, man. He's kind of like Leonardo DiCaprio's character in The Quick and the Dead. Is it possible? Is it possible to improve our perfection? Just super wisecracky. Smart, not smarty, but just like sharp. Yeah, yeah, he's on it. Bill Paxton, if he was alive. He can talk himself out of any situation. Yeah. And he can talk himself into any number of duels, but the boy can't fight. Right, right, right. He's got no skills with a gun whatsoever, man. He doesn't know what he's doing. And this is where his brother comes in. And when he does get into these situations that require uh, a duel to be uh, to settle these situations, he knows that his brother has always got his back. And his brother is... He doesn't talk, man. He's a shy dude. He doesn't get on with people. He hasn't got any of the brother's skills as far as uh, being loquacious and all that kind of malarkey, man. He will crumble in a sentence. He will mm. not be able to function in a rip-roaring, crazy saloon. None of these things he can do. But what he can do, man, is he can shoot like he's got six hands in his pocket, man. The boy is quick. <laughs> Title drop. And so... We'll always get our boy, uh, our brother, getting into all these scrapes with the knowledge that his brother is always there to like be a proxy in a duel. And he's not a mm. proxy as in he will step in in place of his brother. He will be out back somewhere, hanging outside of town like he likes to, with his Winchester rifle all right. scoped up and ready to defend his brother as and when he needs it. And it's all under the guise of like his brother being this fast-talking and fast-shooting, even though he isn't because he can't shoot. Oh, what, if, what if the brother 
have got fake guns with smoke. Yep. And he, yep, he does definitely. his shot. They've just timed it so well. And he he shoots from behind from some hidden concealed place. It looks like the smart talking brothers doing it. Yeah, but it's a stage trick. Gotcha. Yeah, and sometimes they'll like they'll have like a, a frying pan on the side of the like the wherever the jewel's being held, and that will have a squib in it that will go off like he's ricocheted <laughs> it off of the frying. That was that was the craziest shot I ever did see in all my time on this God's green earth, like that kind of a thing. But then, then. Obviously, they come up against a landowner, rancher, evil bastard who is not, when get, when he gets challenged to a duel, is not stupid enough to not scope out every centimetre of that arena first. Mm. The brother is there, ready to take the shot, and then click, click, there's a gun to his head. Mm. The brother gets kidnapped, and now the brother, who's great at talking but shit at fighting, has to learn quick to get good at gunfighting as well and rescue okay. his brother, who has always been his guardian angel throughout the first half of the movie. Nice. I'll take that. I think the um, the person who kidnaps a brother has to be like someone that they've wronged in the past. Like they go from town to town and he's got wise to their tricks and he's figured out that this isn't quite right. Yeah, something's not right, man, because there's something, there's something about the way he was shot. He's always like, because maybe the pan, the gag pan that they have, or like the, the clock tower bell, mm. or wherever, wherever they are, wherever they set the scene, they always have like, you know, the, a bit of flair, he'll bounce it off that. Like the guy's like, he shot straight at me, but that bell rang as if a bullet went off it. That's never yeah, sat so right the, with me. You'd spend loads of time with the bad guy building up to the, like, he's really forensic. They just mess with the wrong guy who happens to be like a detect in another life you'd be Poirot or something like that <laughs> and he just like spends all the- we keep cutting back you don't know why we keep cutting back to it but he's just pacing things out on the street with chalk lines everyone thinks he's mad yeah and he's getting like town town members to like yeah, like to just- hold string and he's taking the string and walking it all the way up to the top and a bit like in the wire it's like a when- one man warren commission <laughs> it's like there's no there's no way <laughs> that bullet did that there's no yes. fucking way yeah yeah I quite like the dude. I quite like the bad guy, actually. He yeah, like maybe he's cool. a good guy, actually, man. Like, let's yeah. uh, let's get this guy on board, man. <laughs> man. And that was one one of the alternate pitches of which we will be bringing you more next week, guys, because we can't Amazing. just leave you hanging, man. And no, we, we can't. Nice little nod back to the things we've done because some of these films that you've you've created give me a lot of pleasure. So thank you very much for that. That's my absolute pleasure, man. And uh, uh, thank you for every single one of the films you protected onto my mind cinema for the last 12 weeks man like you have you made me sit on parts of myself with excitement have, uh, you've made that. me get red in the face I've sweated I've been sun bleached I've gone to space I I've been made heartbroken you you, you, I was thinking about that as I took a swallow earlier uh, mm-hmm. but I'm going to have to time this one well I almost expired <laughs> thanks to your pictures man and I'm thinking back straight like Arsino's adventure and, and mm. the beautiful robot and man combining to get themselves out <laughs> all this issues and him sacrificing oh my god man like genuinely yeah. it's it's been such a uh, absolute flipping pleasure so thank you kindly man it's really really you appreciated Graham my friend than, and thank welcome. you for listening to my babblings as well not only that but like flipping editing them because guys you have no idea how much these <laughs> loose lips sink ships throughout the entire uh, episode that I record man flipping heck but no it's been it's been a pleasure to do this and I think, I mean, it's getting into rebel territory because we don't have a race to okay, pick. We can't pick horses. I don't know what to do. I feel bereft. I feel absolutely nude. I felt kind of nude this whole episode. But at the start, it was exciting nude. And now it's just scary nude, man. We're just out in space. So what you can do is you could confirm or deny to our audience whether there are treats awaiting oh. them on our Spotify account. I absolutely can. Oh, so hopefully there's a couple of treats. Is this what we're talking about? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, excellent. There are completely... <laughs> I, was so, I was looking into Graham's eyes as he said What's that. I was, just, I was willing the answer to my brain, guys. And <laughs> it just it wasn't. Me, <laughs> <laughs> On the count of three. Yeah, so uh, yes, I think I've got some playlists to announce. Is that what we're... You uh, do. Excellent. You do. Thank goodness for that. Uh, Marvellous. Our psychic energy is still strong, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it cannot be defied by a Teams video chat. No, um, yeah, we've got, um, we will have uh, an end of the road playlist that we've got for you guys. We've also got a uh, stiletto, a Billy Joel fable uh, playlist mm. as well, which is going to be uh, in the notes for you guys to listen to. And while we're talking about notes and stuff for you to listen to, obviously, uh, 
we hope so much that you have enjoyed what you've listened to. We appreciate so much you guys listening to us from actually sort of all over the world a bit, which mm-hmm. is uh, kind of mind blowing and really, really is, yeah. wonderful to be able to say. And I'm so glad some of you guys are digging what we're putting down. That's so appreciated. Um, but as well as that, if you fancy dropping us a line, because all we do is talk at you guys, and uh, <laughs> I feel terrible for monopolising uh, the airwaves thus. I don't at all. We obviously clearly love <laughs> We'd it. We'd love it. Uh, so much. But like, if you guys do want to drop us a line, especially now we come to the end of our first season, let us know what you think. Uh, racehorsemovies at theneverpress.com. We would love to hear from you guys. The uh, email yeah. address is going to be in the uh, show notes, as always, as well. And if you have dug it, if you got suggestions if you've got other ideas for horses that we've pitched bring it on send them over we would absolutely love to hear from you guys and hey maybe you will be um a nice hand in shaping what is to come from uh racehorse movies moving forward in the future so uh, we really Wonderful. appreciate that as well guys as much as we appreciate your ears what a beautiful way to wrap it up very eloquent and very delicately put so i guess there's nothing left for us to do we just gotta horribly Jesus. turn the house lights up halfway i'm so sorry open the emergency exits and shuffle yeah. you out onto the street and i guess say goodbye for now from luke and from me and also from the indefatigable can't say that word beautiful angry Mis- <laughs> misnamed projectionist <laughs> up there in the mind cinema, Lloyd the Bird Cotton. We love you very, very much. Thank you for projecting these films into the mind cinema. Absolutely. But I tell you what, Luke, I reckon we'll be back. You're damn right we'll be back. Well, until we do that, you take care of yourselves and take care of everyone else. Enjoy movies, enjoy art, enjoy everything in your life as much as you can and hug and embrace and love each other. And we'll be back for a wrap-up very shortly, I reckon. Absolutely. Keep your ears peeled, guys. And thank you so much and take very good care. Take it easy. Love you, bye. Well, there we have it. Another episode of Racehorse Movies is over. We both hope you had as much fun listening as we did coming up with these films and recording our pitches. If you enjoyed this, please share it around with your friends and loved ones. And if it wasn't your thing, I don't know, maybe share it with someone you miffed with. Who knows? If it's not for them either, maybe you two can build some bridges over that connection. But if you did like picking up what we put down and you fancy checking out some more content from us, then head over to theneverpress.com to take a gander at our novels, poetry and other bits and bobs. Anyway, that's about enough from us. Hope to have you back next time for some friendly chat and barely thought through pitches at Racehorse Movies. Ta-ta! Ta-ta!